Welcome everyone back to the School of Greatness podcast. Very excited about our glass guest. We have Glennon Doyle Melton in the house. Good to see oh, you. Oh, so glad Thank to be you here. for being here. I'm very uh. excited. Um, you've got a new book coming out, which I'm excited to talk about and dive in about. Yes. And you haven't written a book in a while, right? Right. Years. When was the years. last time? Um, four years ago. Four years ago. I think. Yeah. Okay. And that wasn't even, I mean, that was a collection of essays. Uh-huh. So I learned that it's much harder to actually write a, <laughs> a book. <laughs> a full book, yeah. <laughs> I, when I was writing the second book, I realized I had never written a book before. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. This is brutally hard for me. But the first book was a New York Times bestseller. It was a yeah. huge hit. It's yeah. A big success. Yeah. And why do you think people resonated? What was the title of the first book? Carry On Warrior. And why do you think it was such a big hit? And why do you think people resonated with that topic? I think I was just trying to... I was talking about things that... Um, well, mostly women don't talk about in, like what? you know, like pain and mm. um, drinking too much and addiction and um, how freaking hard marriage is. Mm. And especially when you were raised in a culture that tells you that marriage is like the finish line, you know, right. that you just get married and then everything's happily ever after. Um, so but it hasn't been happily ever after. It's not freaking happily ever after for anyone. You know, it's it's right. it's a starting line. Yeah. It's not a finish line. It's a starting line. Mm-hmm. And love is hard. And it's not yeah. pink and unicorns, you know? It's really? Like, oh, man. <laughs> I mean, maybe it is for everyone else. <coughs> it's not for me. You don't and poop Skittles? No. God, <laughs> no. No one in my family does. Okay. They're hard to live with. They're amazing and wonderful. It's the best best part of life. But it's also the hardest relationships. Okay. What, is, what do you think has been the most painful experience in your marriage? Mm, I know what's been the most. So, so Love Warrior is the book that's coming out next. Yes. Um, and that book is a book that I actually wrote in the in my closet. In your closet. Yeah. <clears throat> in my closet every morning. Literal, during, literal yeah, closet. Yeah, I call it my clothis. Oh, I don't I actually have a dark closet. It's mm. great for someone who's like prone to depression to okay. have a, to <laughs> to spend all day in like a ten foot. Yeah. Um, but. So after 10 years of marriage, um, Craig and I were in therapy <coughs> one day, just working on some communication stuff. And he re- he told me that he'd been mm. unfaithful in our marriage. In the marriage. <coughs> in therapy. For the in first therapy. time revealing mm-hmm. this. Yeah. And our therapist didn't even know. And I was absolutely clueless. Like whenever people say to me or said to me in the past like I didn't see it coming or I didn't know I would always think come on, come on yeah serious? yeah but you really didn't see it coming I had no idea wow. no idea and um oh my god I was just I, I remember that day like it was yesterday like just listening to it, that that news and um and so after that time Craig moved out and our life just crumbled wow. um and during Did you that get separated time or just mm-hmm, yeah. Not divorced? Not divorced. I mean, I planned to divorce. Right. But we were separated. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was just doing what women do. I was just like holding my breath and trying to smile and trying to keep my kids okay. We had three little ones mm. who, who had, this was completely out of the blue for them too. Wow. Because they had, I mean, they had Craig's an amazing dad and they had a happy life. And um, so it was terrible. And so anyway, I just would write in the morning. It was the only time that I had to, you know, I write to just kind of, I write like a detective looks for clues. Like I'm clueless all day. And then I kind of, if I can, I have no freaking idea what's going on. And then I, if I have an hour where I can type out words and right. I, I can kind of see the patterns in my life and yeah. get clues on what to do next. Um, but I never, so I wrote every day and it was just how I stayed sane during that time. You know, because you kind of have to pretend like everything's okay, especially mm. when you have kids. Right. You have to act like, you know. You can't be in breakdown no. constantly. They're going to be like, what's wrong? Right. You know, they're going to be. No, the mom's job is just to like <clears throat> smile as the Titanic is like sinking. <laughs> you know, sure, just sure, like, sure. everybody just keep dancing. It's keep fine. playing the music. It's fine. <laughs> We're fine. Yeah. Um, so that was my honest time. Wow. And how long I were you never moved? thought that how I would. Did, how long have you moved out for? So we were separated for, I guess, six months. Um, and then the thing is, I... So I had been to Rock. This is like I think I think about this as like the rock bottom of my marriage, mm-hmm. right? But the good news is that I had been to Rock Bottom before. 
Okay, because when I, I've been an addict since I was ten, I became bulimic when I was ten. It's, it's, it's half a unicorn life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still laughing, so it's okay. But yeah, so I became bulimic when I was ten, and then I never really got that worked out. So it just morphed into other mm-hmm. addictions, mm-hmm. as addiction does, you know, sex or whatever, right? Or drugs and or drinking, all of it, yeah. all of them. I'm just recovering everything. So, um, so when I on Mother's Day 13 years ago, I found I was just found myself on a floor, just shaking from a hangover and terror, and staring at a positive mm-hmm. pregnancy test. And so that is like the first moment that I thought I want to be a mom. Like I think it's mm. the first time I ever wanted to be some anything more than I wanted to be numb. <clears throat> mm. And I, I I just learned early on that life was scary and hard, and I was going to hide in addiction. I think addiction is really a hiding place for sensitive sure. people. Sure. You know, it's just a place where you can go. And feel safe and comfortable and yeah. and love and pain can't touch you control I guess right right you're in control of your yeah. own pain but the thing is that love and pain are the only things that you grow from mm-hmm. so you're safe but you don't grow mm-hmm. right um, but I because of that rock bottom moment that rock bottom moment on the bathroom floor was the best moment of my entire life like it felt like the end of the world mm. because I knew I was going to have to in order to become a mother I knew I was going to have to give up my whole life my whole life was mm. alcohol and partying. Um, so it felt like the end, but it was actually the beginning. Yeah. And everything beautiful in my life has come from that bathroom floor moment. So I knew enough um, during that rock bottom of my marriage to know that rock bottom can be the most powerful place on earth. If you can stay with me. So you're aware of it in the moment. Yeah, totally. I mean, I always <clears throat> have two of me. There's the part of me that's like freaking out. That's in deep pain. And, and then there's the writer part of me that's like, oh, this is interesting. This is like hmm. some good material here. Like, <laughs> Let me journal this right now. Maybe should sit down with this sure, and sure. like go deeper, you know? Um, so, yeah. I mean, I knew that I had to like dive into it and figure out wow. what it all meant. And that's when I, I ended up in therapy. Craig ended up in therapy. And he just completely, he just didn't have a prideful bone in his body. He just did all the work while I was doing my work. And we ended up eventually coming back together, but as, as completely different people in a completely different marriage, sure. which is interesting, right? Wow. You can have a new marriage and yeah. with the same person. So it was a six month separation and he came back. You decided that it was worth coming back. <clears throat> he, he obviously probably didn't want to leave. I'm assuming. Well, after six, no, God, no, he didn't want to leave. No, he no. was, he was sharing. He was in willing a very, to do anything. Yeah. In a fearful way. Yeah. It wasn't like, I'm saying this and whatever happens, happens. No, yeah. no. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, this can never, ever <clears throat> work for anyone unless both people are 150 million percent dedicated to yeah. doing whatever it takes. Yeah. You know, and that's why so many of my friends have loved their marriages um, and put as much hope and love as I did. And it doesn't work mm. because the other person isn't, it, it, you can't control yeah, how much the other person to. wants it. Yeah. You know, uh, the, there has to be nothing that matters except for mm. um, beginning again. Yeah. So when did you realize that you really didn't want it and you didn't want to get a divorce? Um, well, after six months, we moved back in together, but we were in different rooms. After six months when it was when I was like, I will consider trying. That wasn't when I was like. Right, I right. love you. You're that like, was when I'm open to the potential right, possibility, right, of not murdering you. <laughs> yeah. Right, and I'm not making any promises uh, yeah, about right, that. Right. So we moved back in, <laughs> but we were like in two different rooms still, yeah, and that's yeah. when we started therapy together. Okay, but that was just the begin. I mean, we're still right, right. now like working, working, working. Wow. And it's been years. Letting go of hurt, pain, <sighs> yeah, fears. Because it's not like, I mean... And this although, was years ago. Yeah, four years ago. Okay. And it still can feel fresh. I mean... I can imagine. And I've talked to so many women about that, that it, it feels frustrating because you feel like you make progress and things are getting normal again. And then one day you wake up and it's like all the pain's there again. Mm. What happens? Some type of trigger or some type well, of... Well, yeah. Whatever it is. I mean, for me, it's because I'm always... Because I'm writing books about it. <laughs> Poor Craig, right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like, oh, did you forget you married a writer? <laughs> <laughs> and you're the main subject, yeah, right. you're the main character yeah. every, of everything in my book. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think that the progress through something like this, through something traumatic, mm. is more, it's not linear. It's mm. not like we go from like healthy to, or unhealthy to healthy or failure to success. I think it's all circular. Mm. You know, you just come back around to the same pain and the same loneliness. But each time you come around, you're stronger from the climb. You know, I can feel it. Like I can feel myself. I mean, in the beginning when my imagination would go crazy and I'd, it would just lay me out. Wow. I mean, I wouldn't even be able to get out of bed. And now it comes around, it's just like, oh, there it is again. 
and we're going around and around. We're getting stronger each time. So it's a journey, but um, but yeah, that was definitely the most painful moment. Mm. Do you believe pain is a choice we all have, or is it something necessary for all of us to experience in order to grow? Oh my God, I'm. Well, first of all, I'm so excited about pain. I can't, I can't believe you just asked me that question. Um, so I'm somebody who avoided pain completely uh-huh. the first 25 years of my life, right? Because I just thought I couldn't take it. Mm-hmm. So whatever it took to, to hide from the pain, right? Food, booze, whatever. Recently, I figured out, oh my God, I think that everything that I need to become who I'm meant, the woman I'm meant to be is actually inside of that pain. Mm. So I was sitting in this hot yoga class right when everything went crazy and miserable and just so, so and I, um, I ended up just sitting still for 90 minutes because I couldn't move. I wasn't too wow. depressed. And um, I had this crazy experience where every single fear and pain that I'd ever have were just like popping up in front of me and I had nothing to, I'm so used to like scr- doing whatever it takes to avoid the pain, mm-hmm. you know? Um, it was like a game of whack-a-mole where there's no, um, there's no mallet and mm-hmm. all your, all the moles are like your deepest fears and pain. Right. Um, and I was crying through the whole yoga class. And at the end of the yoga class, the yoga instructor comes around and it was like, she knew it was happening. She goes, that was the journey of the warrior. Mm. And I was like, what the hell? Yoga is so weird. <laughs> so, so I get in my van and. <coughs> And I'm driving home and I have this deja vu experience. So I get to my house and I open up this book that I've been reading. Um, and it, it was by Pima Shadron, this Buddhist monk. And, and the paragraph said, if you can sit with the hot loneliness today for 1.6 seconds, when yesterday you could only sit with it for one, then that's the journey of the warrior. Mm. And I realized, oh my God, this is what I've been doing since I was 10 years old. Like when I was 10 years old, I started having these feelings of fear, pain. Like uncomfortable feelings, like fear and and envy and um, loneliness and otherness. And and since we only talk about shiny, happy feelings, I thought there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought that these feelings were something to be ashamed of, something to numb. So the amazing thing is that right when you start feeling your hot loneliness, the world starts showing you all these easy buttons, right? So like... Mine was food. Mm-hmm. The second the hot loneliness would start bubbling inside, I'd numb it with food. Right. Um, then it was booze. Then it was drugs. Some people's is, you know, other people's bodies, sex, right. shopping, unkindness. Like all of these things are easy buttons that we use to transport ourselves out of our pain. To not feel. To not feel. But the problem right. with transporting is that you miss all your transformation. Because all the lessons that we need to, to, to know um, to, to become the people we're meant to be is, are inside the pain. And I was mm. like, oh my God, this is, I am like a butterfly, like a caterpillar yep. jumping out of the cocoon right before I would become a butterfly. Mm. Because we think of pain as like a hot potato. Right. You know, like the second we feel it, we need to get rid of it. Like unkindness. Every time someone's unkindness to kind to you, it's just that they just felt the hot loneliness, mm. but they thought it was a hot potato. So instead of feeling it, they pass it on to Rejected you. Rejected it, right? yeah. But pain is not a ho- it's pain is not a hot potato. It's like I think of it now as like a traveling professor. Like it comes and it knocks on everyone's door, and the wisest people I know just say, "Come in mm. and don't leave." So that's why I have this be I have be still tattooed on my wrist because I think that being able to be still inside of pain and just letting it come and know whatever it is fear, anger, loneliness, envy, just um, Letting it come and knowing that it will, that it's a teacher <clears throat> yeah. and it'll leave you with what you, is the opposite of addiction, it's the opposite of compulsion, right. you know? So God, I think, I think pain is not only, no, I don't think it's a choice. I mean, suffering is a choice. Mm. Suffering is what happens when we try to avoid pain. Yes. Like suffering is what happens when we numb, when we, um, God, we all know addicts who, they ru- I mean, I ruined my family for 20 years. I, that's suffering because I chose not to feel my own pain. Because it doesn't just disappear. It goes somewhere. Yeah. So if I don't deal with my own pain, then it goes on to my family. Right. That's suffering. So that's optional. But pain is just, I mean, I think we could learn so much from it. Like envy. So that's like a hot potato, painful emotion mm-hmm. that people just get rid of all the time. So for me, envy looks like, so I read an awesome article that someone's written like a woman that's written mm. and I read it and I'm like, Oh my God, this is so freaking awesome. <laughs> and it just gets better and better. Yeah. And by the end of it, I'm like, I never liked her. Mm. I just don't like her. Like wow. she might be a good writer, but, and that's a lovely way to live, you know, with envy. 
But when I think about envy closer, so when I was drinking all the time, if someone handed me a book um, written by a woman and they said they loved it, I wouldn't read it. Really? Because I was like looking straight at the sun. It was like, there was like a part of me that knew that a braver, better version of me could do that. Mm. Like I was meant to do that. And I wasn't doing it. And there's nothing more painful than seeing someone doing something that you feel like you were meant to do, yeah, right? Of course. So maybe and maybe we're only envious of people who are doing what, what we're meant made to, to do. Be. And also that you're not taking any steps towards doing it yourself. <sighs> exactly. It's even worse. Yeah, but but it, but if we use it as an arrow instead of a hot potato, that like this is the every time you feel envious of someone, look, don't let it go. Like look closer because mm-hmm. maybe it's an arrow pointing you towards what you're meant to create. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. So I don't know. I'm just so I feel like. For someone who wasted her pain for so long, I'm just curious about it now. Mm. Like, what is this here to teach me? What is this That's here cool to teach That's cool that you're doing that now. I mean, as an athlete, I experience pain all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, just emotional pain, physical pain through my sport, mm-hmm. through the transformation of practice, you know, constantly getting broken down by the coach or by whatever the game, mm-hmm. the situation, the opponent being broken down mentally, physically, emotionally. And being in it, you can't just like leave the game or leave the practice, you know, Mm -hmm. sticking it out to the end and seeing what's possible on the other side has always been powerful for me as an athlete. And it's something I talk about in my book is experiencing pain every day as a way to train yourself to be prepared for the bigger, scarier moments of life and not shy away from them, but to be ready and show up and face the journey like a warrior. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, a simple way to experience pain every day in my mind is just to work out. Mm-hmm. You know, every time I run three miles, I'm exhausted. I want to quit, you mm-hmm. know, but it's like, let's just get through this. Let's, let's experience it. Let's feel it and notice where the pain is coming from. My lungs, my legs, my breath, mm-hmm. my mind. And it just continues to build my pain threshold up mm-hmm. for something bigger or scarier that I can handle. And you learn that yeah. from athletics. That's yeah. so interesting because that <clears> is... <throat> Athletes are people who stay with the pain, but Have most to. of us don't do. I mean, we don't learn that. Like, where else do you learn that other than? It's, that's why I think sports is huge yeah. for kids. I mean, I was just my. I just started running. Mm, good okay, for you. which there's nothing that I hate more it's than running. It's miserable. It's the worst thing on earth. I, just, <laughs> I don't even like people who run. They run. <laughs> But my kid... You're envious of them. I, I, yeah, I don't even know. I'm just like, what are you doing? Like, you're going to end up in the same spot. Like, just sit down. But um, but my kid is a, is a cross-country runner. Mm. And so my friend um, asked me to start running. And I was running with Chase. And I got this horrible cramp in my side. And he said, listen, Mom. <clears throat> the thing is, you think it's going to get worse. And that's why you're scared. But it's not. Just keep running. Just keep running. It's not going to get worse. Just Breathe. keep running. Yeah. And I thought, how much of it is fear? Mm-hmm. It's not the actual pain. It's like this fear that somehow it's going to destroy me. Like this little cramp is going to take me down. And he was saying to me, no, 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 just feel it. Take the fear away from it. Just feel it. It's there mm-hmm. and keep going. Yeah. But that's pretty bad. It's interesting you said that. I was watching a briefly um, <clears throat> a Will Smith movie earlier. I can't remember which one it is, but his son is in it. And at one point he's telling his son, you know, fear is not real. It's a choice. Mm. Danger is very real, mm-hmm. but fear is a choice that we have every single day. It's an illusion. So it's interesting. That's interesting. Mm. Yeah. It's like, it's like that whole, the only thing we have to fear is fear. Yeah. Exactly. Right? And it's like, for me, the, when I think about pain, I, I want to be, I don't want to be afraid of pain anymore. I just want to be afraid of the easy buttons. Mm. You know, I don't want to be afraid. that's who you were for 20 years. Yeah. 30 years. Yeah, I was so afraid of pain when I really should have been afraid of the overeating and the drinking. And I was, I should have been afraid of all the things that were trying to, that I thought were going to kill the pain. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just scared of all of those things. Mm, That's interesting. Now, who was the most influential person in your life growing up? I mean, I have an amazing family. Both of my parents and my sister. I mean, my sister who's here now, who's with me everywhere Mm -hmm. I go. Mm Mm-hmm. My sister um, and I have been inseparable since she was born. Yeah. When I started drinking so much, that was the biggest loss in my life. Is that you can't have, you can't have a close relationship yeah. when your best friend is alcohol. You know, so um, so we were just broken mm. for twenty five years. Really, wow. I mean, just broken from from that addiction. Um, and the second I was ready, I mean, from that bathroom floor. From the bathroom floor, the call I made was to my sister. Wow. And um, she came and literally picked me up off the floor and put me in a car and took me to my first meeting. Mm. And since then, we haven't 
there has not been one day when we haven't talked, including, I mean, when, when, um, when I started writing was because she brought me a laptop and was like, wow. this is what you're meant to do. Wow. I want you to sit down every day. She was leaving. She went to, she moved to Rwanda. To, she joined the international justice mission and was prosecuting child, um, rapists mm. in Rwanda. She said, I'm going to go do my thing. You're going to stay and do your thing and you're going to get up every day and write, and I'm going to go do this thing that I need wow. to do. And by the time she came back, Mama Terry was off and running. Blown up. Yeah. It's amazing. And that's how Mama we, Terry's your blog. Yes, Mama right. Terry's Where my you blog. you write about mm-hmm. this journey, these experiences. Yeah. And it's specifically mostly for women, right? Yeah, but blog. a lot of guys are, I mean, it's interesting. <clears throat> I mean, basically all we do is tell the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, we talk about all of it. It started off talking a lot about motherhood because at the time that I was started, I started, I was just like dripping with children. I just had them, I had three children yeah. and I was home with them all day because that's a great choice for someone with high anxiety (laughs) disaster um but now that the kids are growing and my world is getting bigger we're just talking we talk about everything Mm, we talk about faith and love and hope and healing and addiction and all of it what was the biggest lesson your sister taught you show up my sister's the best shower upper i've ever met what does that mean to you to show up well i don't know i think um some people and i do this we all um we think that when we, in order to, to be effective, in order to be a friend, in order to be a mother or a, or a husband, or a, we have to like say the right thing or do the right thing or be the right thing. And so that keeps us from just showing up for each mm-hmm. other. You know? And I think that we, we freak ourselves out. That, that fear thing. My sister is the one who just, she's there no matter what. She doesn't yeah. worry about saying the right thing. She doesn't worry. She's just, you know that when you pick up a phone, she's going to be there 10 minutes later. Or she's going to, you know, she was on a, the day after I called her from the parking lot after that therapy session and she was on a plane the next morning to my house, you know, just like the showing up because we never remember what people said. Like, it's not, that's not the point. The point is when I'm in this place in my life and I know that you're going to be there, Mm. like just your body, you know, just your being is going to be there. She's taught me so much. Why do you think she showed up for you after essentially it sounds like you were neglecting her friendship or relationship for so many years why do you think she was like i'll be there for you even though you i'm assuming weren't there for her no, through your addictions I wasn't. no i wasn't so um, why do you think she was so willing somebody asked her that at a speaking event we do our speaking events together now so mm-hmm. it's like she and i just talking That's back cool. and forth on a stage um and somebody said how could you just be so you know because because um, addiction can cause so much damage in relationships. Mm-hmm. So how, how were you able to love her so well after all of that? And what I thought was interesting is that she's a very, very healthy person. Like she's a very healthy person. So she seems very healthy. Yeah. And so she has really good boundaries. I don't even know what boundaries are. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she, and she kept really good boundaries, even for loving me so much. She understood that this is a monster between us. Like this addiction is a monster. And the thing about a monster is that it hurts everybody in the area. Mm-hmm. Right. So what she said from stage was that she thinks she kept healthy enough um, boundaries that our relationship wasn't ruined because what happens with a lot of people who love addicts is they stay close yeah. and they get torn to shreds. So she should essentially didn't talk to you that much. No. Yeah. I mean, she loved me. Surface level, and it was from afar, and it was right. And she was checking it, but it wasn't. She wasn't enmeshed with me. It wasn't allowing her to control her life, or consume her, or let you take advantage of her, or make her feel wrong or bad or something, or take over her life. Yeah, which happens a lot. So many people who love addicts is that their life stops. Like my life stopped when I was ten. My sister's life could have stopped too, if she would have just stayed right Mm -hmm. there with me when I just sat down in the sand and said, "I'm not going any further." She could have stayed there Mm -hmm. and just let her entire life revolve around me. And that would have helped neither of us. We probably wouldn't even be friends now. Wow. Because she would be resentful. Yeah. But because she went on with her life, the second I called her and said, I'm ready, she was able to be there. And ever since, you know? Mm. So I think it has a lot to do with healthy boundaries. That's smart. It's great to know. Boundaries. It's tough to like not be there for your sibling or your Mm -hmm. daughter or your son or your parents if they're going through that. You know, Mm -hmm. when has it become too much? When has it become you're actually not being there for them or you're not making a stand for them? Mm Mm-hmm. And blurring the line between it's controlling and manipulating. Yeah. How do you someone navigate that? Like, I'm going to be there for my family member, my partner, whatever. Mm-hmm. How many years do you go through of them, you know, taking advantage of the situation or your love and mm-hmm. kindness before it's too much? Is that a gut feeling? Is that a... I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I think what 
the only thing that I can say to that is when you know it, know it. Yeah. I mean, most people know it and then they go five more years. Be aware of it. Yeah. No, like when, when you, when in the depths of your heart, you know, I'm actually not showing up for her anymore. I'm showing up for her addiction. Mm. Cause that's what we do. I mean, we co we become codependent and like, so I don't know how many parents, I mean, I, I, I talk to men- mental health professionals all the time. That's one of the groups that I talk to the most. And so many, I mean, so, you know, I'm, I'm showing up for her. I'm, I'm cleaning, I'm doing her laundry when yeah. she passes out. No, I'm doing that. I'm, that's not, you're, you're, you're showing up for her disease. Yeah. You're allowing the disease to, it's not love, right? I mean, love is not, love is not that easy and it's not that hard, <laughs> right? Love is not like, I will continue. My, I think my parents loved me well because they were like, we cannot see you do this anymore. And I know that they cried themselves to sleep at night, but there was a, um, nobody was helping me with my alcoholism. You know, I was, that, that, maybe that's why I was, that, that's why I was able to hit rock bottom Yeah. earlier than I was have. there for you. I mean, nobody was going to be there for me until I was going to be there for myself. You showed up, yeah. The person who needed to show up first was me. Now, how does – I get that, and I understand it, but one – let's just say you kind of um, clear ties with the person who's got the addiction, and you're not there for them as much, and they keep reaching out to you, and then all mm-hmm. of a sudden they commit suicide. Mm-hmm. How do you know, like – how do you know? How do you navigate how do you not this? have guilt? Yeah, or whatever? just be like, oh, I could have been there for them. Or I don't know. How does someone, because I'm assuming that's happened many times. Oh, yeah. Where people oh say, God, okay, yeah. I'm not going to be there for you because you have this addiction. Right. So figure it out. And when you're ready and when you want support, come to me. And then the life is over. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's brutal. I mean, I yeah. don't think it gets much brutal than that. I mean, when, by the time somebody gets to suicide, that's a major, major mental health issue. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's not any, you, the the problem is, is that you're using the wrong currency to try to solve something. So no mental illness, including addiction, including depression, including anxiety has ever been cured by love. Okay. That's like trying, trying to like, no, Mm. love does not cure mental addiction. Love does not cure cancer. Love right. does not cure diabetes, right? Right, and love does not cure mental illness. Like that's the thing, but we don't. But if but if someone with cancer dies, we don't say I didn't love them enough, right? But mental illness is a. I mean, I'm mentally ill. I've, I'm dep- I have a depression. I have anxiety. I have major prone. I'm majorly prone to addiction. It, it's it's there. I have serotonin issues in my brain mm. that I need medication for. I mean, whenever someone says, "What are you depressed about?" I say, "What are you diabetic about?" Mm. It's like, <laughs> it's an actual medical condition, right? Mm-hmm. So, and by the time somebody gets to suicide, man, I mean, that's far down the mental illness. Right. That's like a nine or a 10 or yeah. an 11 off the scale, right? So, I mean, at some point we have to, if, if we could shift the thinking from um, mental illness as some kind of personality, lack of love, it's not. It can't be cured by love. Mm. Like no matter how much somebody loves me, they're never going to cure me of my depression, yeah. Right? Unless they have shots of serotonin that they can stick into my brain, you know? So um, I, I think that once we change the conversation to be accurate about mental health, that kind of guilt and shame will go away because mm. people will understand that you do not love somebody right. out of addiction. Interesting. So I'm curious, how did you guys reconnect then? What happened after you guys moved back in? Um, what yeah. was the next steps? Therapy together. Yeah. And then when did you realize, okay, I'm going to give this a chance again? <sighs> Well, we started therapy. All right. So at first I started therapy sec- separately uh-huh. and he was in therapy separately because uh-huh. I knew we have to like dive in. Over to the <laughs> so, so what I figured out is that, that I was having major issues with intimacy because that's what happens in therapy. You think you're going in to fix someone else and then you get screwed with all the stuff you still have to work mm-hmm. on. Right. So I, since I became bulimic when I was 10, I I just bought into all the weird messages that the world gives girls sure. about their bodies, right? Mm-hmm. And so what happens to a lot of women, young, is that, you know, so if we're body, mind, and spirit, we're trinities, body, mind, and spirit. Girls, we get so many confusing messages about our bodies that basically at some point we just disassociate, we like vote our body off the island, mm. okay? We stop um, understanding at a very deep level that we that our bodies are a part of our us which makes sense because women's bodies are commodities right, right? we're taught early on that right, your right. body is to sell yeah, your body is to whatever yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. this is not a sp- this is not your spiritual home this is like a victoria's secret but whatever so um so what my therapist said is we need to like have a reunion we need to like pull you back together we need to make you whole again you know like vote your body back on the island 
So basically, I was like, that sounds really hard. Do you have any more pills? <laughs> right. And she was like, no. Can you just fix me with the, the easy button? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> she was like, no, we're going to do the work. We're going to do the work. So um, so that's why I was having, I was just having lots and lots of, ish- of issues with sex. Like mm. I couldn't figure out how to use my body to love and be loved. To be intimate. Yeah. Like, I mean, I would be there, but I wouldn't be there. Like I would be like hanging out above the sex happening and emotionally you were somewhere else i was like i'm just gonna make the grocery list it's interesting because most women are usually it seems like they're more emotionally connected than the men Mm -hmm. right especially when sex they don't want to be i don't know i I get an idea that most women are are more present yeah but that but when we think of emotionally that that's because you guys love with your bodies yes so okay this is perfect (laughs) right because so when i'm having a conversation Uh i'm like there yeah. I'm like, yes, we are, uh, we are loving each other. Connected. Like we are, oh my God, this is love. In our you know? souls. Yeah. And our, this is it. Cause, cause, cause I body and spirit, yeah. right? If we're having a meeting of the minds or a meeting of the soul, I'm like, this is mm-hmm. love, yes. right? Craig is a boy. All right. Well, he's a man now, <laughs> Yes. but he, he was a boy once. Okay. So he's a male. body, mind and spirit. <laughs> he was taught at a young age. The, my, the, 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 the same world that was giving me all the confusing messages about my body was giving him very con, uh, confusing messages about emotions. Right. Right? That's what we he's, were talking about before. Right. Yes. He's a boy. He's not allowed to feel. He's uh, not allowed to... So then he cry, voted that emotions. off the island. Yes. So then here we are, two people. I'm trying to love him with my body. With, I'm sorry, with my mind and my spirit. He doesn't live there. He doesn't even feel it. He's like... Mm-hmm. He doesn't understand I'm trying to give love or... And he's trying to love with his body because that's yeah. how that's what's real to him. And yeah. I'm like, oh, like oh, that's not real. Yeah. It doesn't feel real to me. So we are completely missing each other, right? No wonder it didn't work for ten years for both you in some way. Totally. And I yeah. think that and and like we had to start over, man. I mean, I had to like we had to like start holding hands. You didn't hold hands before. Yeah, but I wasn't there. Like I didn't understand what was going on. Yeah, You're like I wasn't. It. No, I was like, ugh. We had to like right. actually. We had to practice kissing. Really? Pr- yes. Oh my God, Lewis. It was so. So you could just weird. be present in the yes. moment. We had to practice eye contact, like uh. all of these things that were so threatening to me, mm. because threatening, then you go into fight or flight. Flight. I'm gone. Mm-hmm. Right. So I am gone with him with any kind of conversation where I wanted to go deeper. He was gone. Gone. Fight or flight. Like, the, I'm, I feel it's threatened. Like, yeah, I can't good. do this. I'm good. He wouldn't look taught, in the eye probably. Yes. Just like, eh. I was taught young that Deal this isn't, yeah. Figure or he'd just out. start panicking and saying things that didn't make sense. Like, so. <laughs> it's so, a whole different language. It's a whole, because guys are like sports, weather, mm. be, poor guys. I don't know you how you guys make it. Like, Judge. you have all the human feelings we have, and they're stuck talking about this BS all the time. I mean, we need a revolution. <laughs> But um, so it was a practice. It was a practice of me starting to understand that my body actually is a part of me that can offer mm. and receive love and him understanding that his emotions are a part of him that can give and receive love. Yeah. Right. So he had to practice loving me with his mind and I had to practice loving him with my body. And so that very interesting thing happens when relationships where these terrible things happen, like our rock bottom, that come into our life to heal. Yeah. I mean, I had a part of me that needed to heal, right? Mm -hmm. And he had a part of him that needed to heal. And they were like completely separate. So the amazing thing I think about is regardless of whether my marriage, we made it and for now, but like if we hadn't, it still would have been a freaking miracle because I became whole because of it Mm. and he became whole because of it. So if we would have gone our separate ways, it still would have been a major redemption story. Yeah. You know? Um, so I don't, I don't think of it as like our story is wonderful because we stayed together hmm. at all. Like I think our story is wonderful because we use something really crappy to become more whole. Yeah. Interesting. So where are you guys at now? Everything working perfectly or the perfect Oh yes. Marriage? It's like Disney, Lewis. <laughs> it's like perfect. Mickey Mouse that, is running around Oh my God. All we do is smile little. and run through the sunflowers. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's good. It's what marriage is. Mm. It's lots of moments that are so joyful that you just can't believe you get to spend your life with this person and other moments where you're like, oh my God, I'm spending my life with this person. Mm. Like that's, you know, I mean, love is just a relentless showing up and it just creates this like alchemy in you where you figure, you know, it's a, I, I, it's a spiritual practice for me. Like every single thing that bugs me about Craig ends up being something that I need to heal in myself. Right. 
So, um, no, it's not all perfect. And there's still Mm. all kinds of pain. And some days I wake up and I feel like I'm exactly back in that therapy room and it's all fresh and new. Um, and that's when it's Craig's turn to be, to relentlessly show up and to not allow pride to be a part of our marriage. That's tough for a man. Yeah, it is. I mean, can you imagine what he's been through? Like with this whole, like he has had to re- it reminds me of that scripture that's like you have to lose your life to find it. I mean, he's had to lose everything right. that he thought he was and just build himself up again. It's been mm. fascinating to watch. What do you think you cry about the most? Oh, God. Well, that's for me especially, that's a hard question because I cry all the time. Like I'm, mm. I, I just watched the last episode of Parenthood last night and I was like in convulsion. Mm. Like I was crying so hard. Let's say, let's say uh, <laughs> when you're alone by yourself in the middle of the night. Maybe you're not alone, but yeah. when you're alone to your thoughts, what is the thing that makes you cry the most? Okay, I have some great fears that make me cry. One is I'm scared for my kids. I'm scared that like living this life out loud um, will cause them harm that I can't see. Mm. Yeah, because I don't know what it is, you know. Um it's hard enough to have a family that's imperfect. We all have families that are imperfect. And we've talked to our kids about this. We've, we, they know everything. Sure. Um, Which is hard. Yeah. And then all our hard. friends know or whatever. Yeah. So that's hard. Your I mean. friends' moms know or whatever, you know, because they read your books. Yeah. That kind of stuff. And I don't care about those people. I really don't. Sure, I sure. could care less. I mean, I know that everybody's underneath everybody's house. There's fires. Right. I mean, I know enough. I talk to enough women mm-hmm. to know that. There's Everyone's nobody's their life that's yeah. perfect, right? Yeah. Um, but not knowing how living all of this out loud will really affect my kids. Okay. That scares me. And losing the people in my life scares the crap out of me. Mm. Like just becoming an age where I look at friends and they're losing their parents or losing people mm. that I love. Who's the person that scares you the most to lose? My sister. Mm. Isn't that terrible? Because I, I know right away I should say my husband or my kids, but... I mean, siblings, man, you know, those are the ones who are with you from the time you're born till the time you die. Like, yeah. I, I don't know. We talk probably eight times a day. Wow. I mean, every hour. It's ridiculous. Um, I think of her as like one of my lungs. You know, I don't know how. Everything that I do is to make her proud. Wow. Isn't that Watch weird? parents. No, they're already so proud of me. Like they, oh. they, they're just glad I'm vertical, Lewis. I mean, do you, that you're do you, alive. That I'm like you're breathing. They don't. Care. They're just like, oh my god, you're like a citizen. You're like an upstanding <laughs> citizen. You have yeah. a library card. Like they are. <laughs> they just the didn't driver's see, license. Yeah. It's not revoked. You're not in jail. <laughs> this is so amazing. But for, why your sister? Why do you have any other siblings? No. Okay. It's just the two of us. Why? Why to make her proud? Not your husband or your kids. I don't know. Well, first of all, we're on this journey together. She I mean, works we do with Mama's Dairy together. Yeah, yeah. She's working we with do, you. Yeah. yeah. So this is, I mean, this journey is separate from my husband and kids in a way that's important for it to be separate. Mm. For, I want my family life to be my family life. Like, yeah. I don't do anything like that. I don't do anything in my town. No one in my town cares really? or knows yeah. anything about well, my life. You're kind of like a... Retired town in Naples, right? I mean, it's Naples, so no one even has the internet. (laughs) Everyone's 90, right? And in bed by 7. I've been to Naples, yes. Yeah, it's exactly my speed, Lewis. So awesome. 9 o'clock, everyone's lights out in Naples. What's the thing you... It's Amanda, right? Yeah. What's the thing you admire about her the most? Well, she's everything that I'm not. So and that's the other thing. Like we make up, we're like one brain. So I'm all the creative. I'm all mm-hmm. the feeling. I'm all the, and she's, I mean, she's a lawyer. Like she, right. she does absolutely everything that I can't do. So the amazing thing about that is I feel like oftentimes in friendships or marriages or there's the practical one and then there's the dreamer one. Mm-hmm. And the dreamer one gets to be the dreamer one because there's a practical one. Yeah. Right? Like, so I can only be me because there's her. Yeah, I can you, only, it kind of makes you feel safe to because, go a little crazy. Yeah, and stuff gets done. Yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I wouldn't. We would have no business. I wouldn't be here. I, there's right. no way I would have made it here. Right, I wouldn't right. have made the flight. I wouldn't like. I can be myself and always be thinking of these big, creative, mm-hmm. beautiful things because she's handling the business. Yeah. You know, and that's a little bit how Craig is too. I think people, the dreamer types, are often attracted to the practical. My, my friend calls it the kite holder and the kite. It's hard to have two dreamers in a relationship <laughs> because 
someone's got to step up and say, let's get something done. Let's be practical. And then they become a little resentful that they can't do what they're supposed to do. Totally. Right? Yes. It's like the dreamers has to have a little bit of practicality in them to be able to get things done. Yeah. You've got to be able to wake up and brush your teeth. Right. You know, and put clothes on and like Yeah. Shower. Or if you have a sister. I mean, my sister's two days ago is like, I'm out. And she's like, did you put sunscreen on? She's texting me. Like, it's stuff like that. I'm like, oh my God, no. I didn't put freaking sunscreen on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. You have so many things in your mind that you're, you you're know. You're always like writing, like yeah, exactly. thinking of big things. This is why people like me are always running into doors and like <laughs> slamming things. You know, we can't find our keys. We're like, sure, sure. It, but it's not, we, we don't, we say it's not because we're disorganized. It's because we're thinking of very important things. Mm -hmm. We can't think of like the mundane right, things. Right, right, right. But um, no, Craig is like that too. And I, I think I have, I actually deep in my heart have, I think, a big, maybe even bigger respect for the practical ones than the dreamers. It's hard. Because I just feel like they're doing the work. Like, uh -huh. they're making it happen while we get to do our, you know, whatever. Yeah. And Craig's a lot like that, too. I mean, every morning my vitamins are all lined up. Every, I mean, he's he does all the cooking. He does wow. everything. Every, he's, the, he's a wife. Like, he's my wife. And wow. I love, I mean... He is, we figured out early on in our relationship that our roles needed to be reversed because I was trying to cook and it was a disaster every night. Like, and then he took over, we switched roles and everything like started working. Wow. If you like throw all those roles up and all the things that need to be done as a married couple and instead of just like letting them fall where they're typically female or typically male, you actually figure out who likes to do, who's better. Right. It works out so much better. Yeah. He like really loves cooking. There you go. I know. My kids don't even cry at dinner anymore. Our buddy Rob Bell, he loves to cook now too. I don't know if you know that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's big into cooking. And Kristen was like, I just, he just wants to cook all the time now. So. And nobody's complaining. Exactly. Right? He loves it. <laughs> yeah. And maybe there's different, uh, you know, based on what stage of life we're in, or those rules will change. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. I don't think that one will change. <laughs> yeah, I feel you're never going to cook. I mean, 30 letting years. him have it till we die. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you want to pick it up one day. Maybe. You'll see maybe. it as a creative, uh, uh, in uh, the next book to write, it'll involve cooking now or that something. that would be something. And you'll just get to play. Right. And he'll be organized with how much ingredients. <laughs> exactly. He'll do the shopping stuff. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. Uh, what would you say is the thing you admire the most about Craig? I know what that is. Um, even when... I've never seen, when I said the showing up thing about my sister, I've never seen someone show up as relentlessly as Craig, as Craig Melton did after our implosion. Afterwards, I, he should continue to show up. Oh my God, Lewis. Like I was, we had conversations where I was like, listen to me. I am never coming back to you. Like it's done. It's over. Mm. I'm going for divorce. I'm never speaking to you again. No. I'm never. Like you're, you're wasting your time. And he'd be like, and I mean, he would say, I don't care. Like if it's, if it's the rest of my life. I'm going to keep, and it was, every, wow. he's like, go do what you need to do. Go whatever. Like you are my wife. And no matter what you do, I'm going to keep showing up for you. And it was just a relentless, it wasn't like weird stalkerish. It was like just, every day, like I'd go out and, the, and there'd be like groceries on the front step. I'd go out to my car and all the oil would be changed. I'd go out like every freaking day for months. And I, I'm telling you, he would have done it for a decade. I think he was just, and the, he was I committed. think so many, so many people just give up, you know. And I don't mean give up. I think there are. I do not think that all marriages should be saved. I know, I'm not one of those at all. Like I think there are plenty of marriages that just need to die so there can be new life, you know. Um, but one thing that I respect about him is that he just did not go down without a fight. Mm -hmm. And it would have been so easy for him to just be swallowed up in shame, and to let have let that take him out of the game. Um. And he didn't. Mm. So, I mean, he fought like hell for his family, and I wow, respect that's that. that's great. And were you ever unfaithful with him? No. 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 I mean, are you kidding? I, like, didn't even want to make out with him. I wasn't right. going to go make out with other people. Right, I right. was like, it's taken me long enough just to figure <laughs> out the sex thing with wow. my husband. But you know what? Like, when you, when you say that, like, are you unfaithful? I mean, I just think that sex for Craig was his easy button. I think that when he, that's how, what he learned, mm -hmm. um, growing up, he's a great looking guy, like girl, it, sex for a him has guy. always been, See photos with yeah, he's like, really freaking good, good looking. looking I know. I know. Can you imagine the poor guy? He's probably like, why don't you want to make out with him? <laughs> exactly. Um, but I understand easy buttons, you know, I, 
I was, I guess in every way you could say I was unfaithful to my family growing up. I mean, I use alcohol and, right. and other things, yeah. but it, it was lucky for him that I understood that concept that I understand that you can love someone and let something like sex or booze or drugs get in the way. Mm. I knew that because yeah. I'd done it for, I love my family. I love my sister. I love, and I still chose yeah. alcohol and drugs over them forever. So I understood that concept. Wow. You know? So, I mean, I have never been unfaithful with sex with Craig, mm -hmm. but I've certainly been unfaithful to um, the people that I love mm -hmm. with things like sex and booze and all of that. So I get sure, it. Sure, sure. Yeah. And you could also say that you were essentially unfaithful for 10 years by not actually being there with him Amen. for the thing that he needed or thing he wanted, right? Totally. Totally. You were somewhere else, essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, if there has to be, I mean, to, to, to really be in love, I mean, I think of it being in love, I think it's interesting that people call it in love, like it's a place. <laughs> because it really, to me, the way I understand it now is it's a place. Like it's a place that you fall into with someone else where you are completely present body, mind, and spirit, right? Like who you're, you're like loving someone with your mind. You're loving someone with your soul and you're loving someone with your body. Like that's being in love. Yeah. And so I was never that with Craig because I couldn't be vulnerable with my body. You know, I just, just so, so that's interesting, right? Like that's the difference in like an, a truly intimate relationship is that with other people or with other, you can be, you can have a meeting of the minds, you can have a mm -hmm. meeting of the soul, but to really be in that magical, intimate place, <clears throat> you have to be fully present, all three. <clears throat> yeah. Now, most people probably don't know listening. For those that listened to an episode I did about, a, I think it was about a year and a half ago, two years ago, I did a, uh, an episode about experience I had as a kid where I was raped by another man mm -hmm. that I didn't know. And I remember you kind of guided me through this. You coached me through this. So thank you again mm -hmm. for being there for me. It was like an incredibly challenging, scary yeah. moment. So I appreciate you being there for me. And I remember you saying something like, just get ready because you're about to have a big hangover. Mm -hmm. Something along that, mm -hmm. like a vulnerability yep, hangover. Yep, 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 <clears throat> and um, and I, I didn't know what you were even talking about until hundreds of emails came in, and messages that were just like, heartbreaking, mm -hmm. you know, for people sharing their stories about sexual experiences that happened to them, sexual abuse that happened to them when they were younger and opening up for the first time. And just like my heart broke mm -hmm. every time I read an email and for like a week and a half, I just wasn't myself. Mm -hmm. It was just like reading these emails, trying to like figure out what's happening. And it was just really heartbreaking. So I'm curious, how do you handle uh, a vulnerability hangover mm -hmm. and how would you coach someone else in that process as well? I was so proud of you for that. Thank you. That was so amazing. I appreciate it. So amazing. I remember that day that you told me, I think you sent me a text or something and said, I'm going to do it. It's going live. And I actually mm. pulled my car over. I, I just dropped <laughs> I know, my I kids over. You. I like pulled my I car over. I was like, that. oh my God, all the energy right now. Like, let's just. <laughs> you were amazing. I'm on the other side of the country, but let's just focus this up. You were amazing. Yeah. Um, and you do you know amazing. that? Do you know that night? I didn't know what was happening this day, but that night was like a super moon. Did you know this? No. It was like a full moon, but it was like a super moon that only happens like once every hundred years or something. Oh. And so I press. I was in this room when I submitted it, and then I was like, "Okay, take a deep breath. It's done." I like it's up on my blog, and I just sent one tweet with like the headline, and that's all I did. I didn't share it anywhere else. Oh, God. And then I remember opening this sliding door right here and looking out and seeing the biggest moon I'd ever seen in my life, like staring at me. I was just like, wow. I was just in awe of this moment. And then I looked on Twitter and it was like, <laughs> one of the brightest super moons is happening right now. And I was like, what if this is like so weird how it's happening. So, um, mm. but anyway, sorry. Yeah, you were incredible mm. for, for sort supporting me. I mean, I asked Lennon to really tell me like everything about how to put this out there in an authentic way that would not upset people, but also people could uh, receive it and understand it. And you were like, I don't. I don't think I could have done it without you. So oh, I appreciate that. It's yeah. amazing. So brave. So brave, and helped so many people. Yeah, it was still does. Yeah. Um, I don't know about that vulnerability hangover. That Brene Brown says that 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 we're always going to feel that when we've revealed something. I mean, I don't know, but I figured out that I really, really believe that we can either be shiny and admired, or we can be real and loved, hmm. but that we have to choose. Really. Oh my God. Shiny and admired. Are real, real and loved. loved. Yeah. And I, and I, 
all the time. I mean, I keep choosing real and loved over and over again. And I, you can get hurt there. I mean, that the, the, the funny thing is about the, the vulnerability is like the thing now. Everybody be vulnerable. This is vulnerability, vulnerability. And so people think, okay, I'll do that. That's the answer. So I'll do that and then everything will be awesome, right? But no, I mean, if you're vulnerable, you will get hurt. <laughs> like yeah. you, It's scary. It's hard. I mean, for every six people who like what you've said and who are helped mm-hmm. by it, there's going to be four who hate what you've said yeah. and think you're doing it for the wrong reasons and think you're, I mean... You, when you're going to be vulnerable, you have to know that there will be, it will not all be pink and, and fuzzy. Like right. there will be pain there. Yeah. But I really, really think that the pain that comes from being real and loved is not the same as the pain that comes from hiding. Because mm. you're going to have pain either way. Exactly. It's pain here or pain here, right? But this kind of pain is just badass pain. You know, it's like I can take that and I can take more and I can keep its freedom. Right. Mm. Because it's like this, there's love with it. It's freedom. You're just like, there's no shame and, and it's ouch, but you recover faster and you feel, um, you feel free and you feel real. Um, and people really know who you are. So if they, they don't like you, screw them. Like, right. like, you know, I mean, or maybe they're not the right match for you, but at least you're showing yourself Yeah. over here. It's just like this withering, <laughs> you know, it's just like this slow death of like, right. I've been put on this earth and I am never going to be who I, who I am. So I don't know, I, with the vulnerability hangover, I would say just keep having it. Mm, just yeah. keep choosing it and keep, and, and when it comes, when, when the pain comes after you've shared yourself, don't assume that that means you've done something wrong. It's just the pain that comes. Yeah. It's, it's the right, it's the process. Yeah. And, and it gets better, right? You it feel does, it absolutely. and you hide in your covers and you like eat your ice cream mm-hmm. and it's like terrible for a little while and then you're, yeah. and then you're fine again. It's interesting. And the more... I, I dive into the vulnerability, at least of that experience. It doesn't own me or control me anymore. Mm-hmm. It's not scary anymore. Mm-hmm. Like I can share it, like talking about what I ate for dinner last night, essentially. Um, and it doesn't, it's not this scary thing. That's like, Oh, it's consuming me. It's controlling me. Every thought of mine. So I definitely, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's like every time we get those scary demons out from the dark of inside our, our, ourselves, we get them out into the light and they're just like these little, yeah, you're like, oh my God, I spent my whole life being terrified of that thing and I've gotten it out. And it's like the second you, they get out into the light and people start saying me too, mm. you're like, oh, dumbass thing. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> controlled me for so long and it was yeah. just like a little gremlin. And everyone's experiencing it. Oh my God. A lot of people are experiencing it, yeah. Oh yeah. my God. Interesting. Uh, I got a few questions left for you. We've, okay. we've been going for a while, but I, uh, I feel like I could talk for hours I with know. you. Um what should we really know about this book? What's the thing that's going to, who's it going to be sp- speaking to the most? And what's the biggest lesson that you think people are going to take away from this? Well, it's not an easy book. Mm-hmm. It's um, beautifully written, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's not an easy book to read. It's raw mm-hmm. and um, much more honest than people usually are yeah. about their marriages. You're very honest. Um what I think it's about really, because I mean, there's a reason I didn't call it love warriors. Like I don't really see it as a marriage story. Actually. I see it as like what happens to someone when really for real, the shit hits the fan mm-hmm. and you're just torn down to the bottom and you have a choice of just withering away or just rebuilding again. And that, that's why I call it love warrior. Cause I really think that if our marriage wouldn't have come back together, it would have been written anyway. Yeah. Right. It just, it would have had a different ending but it still would have been the warrior's journey. Yeah. Um, I think what it ends up being about is how our ideas, our culture's ideas, what our culture teaches us about masculinity and femininity make it close to impossible for actual males and actual females to love each other. <laughs> so true. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. And yeah. I think in order for a real man and a real woman to actually really love each other, the woman and man that you're seeing in front of you, what it requires is an incredible unlearning mm. an unlearning of everything that the culture culture has, has tried to teach you about what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. That's what it was for us. It was a peeling away, just this boot camp of, of realizing how much we'd been poisoned by our culture until, until we were stripped down to who we actually were. And we were like, Oh my God, like I'm finally actually seeing you. Mm. 
I'm not seeing this idea of what I think a man is supposed to be. And I'm not being anymore this idea of what I think a woman is supposed to be. This is actually me and actually you. It's going back to the freaking poem in the beginning of the Bible. It's the Garden of Eden. It's like, finally, I am naked and unashamed in front of you. Um, that's what it's about. Mm, I love it. Thank you. I love it. I'm excited. I'm, well, it's already out. Well, it's, it's going to be, it's gonna be, be out. August, you can, yeah. Depending on when this comes you can out, you can pre-order it right yeah. now, yes. And uh, I'll have it all linked up here at the end of this, but it's called Love Warrior, so make sure to pick this up. It's an exciting book. So I'm glad you're writing it, and uh, I know my people are going to love it. A um, few questions left for you. Yes. This is something that I ask a lot of people at the end of my, my interviews. And um, before I get to that question, let's ask you another question. What are you most grateful for in your life recently? I'm so grateful for my sobriety. Mm. I'm so grateful for my sobriety. I feel like sobriety to me is, I mean, for me, it wouldn't even make sense to say any people. Because I don't get any, I don't get love from my people without my sobriety, right? Mm-hmm. So I just, I can't believe that the way I started this life, that I ended up in a place where I can deal with what comes to me. Mm-hmm. Like in rea- like I can deal with the reality of the world and love and pain with no easy buttons. Right. That's what I'm most grateful for. That's cool. Uh, it's the end of your life. Mm-hmm. Many, many years from now. You've had an incredibly full life. You've achieved every dream you've ever imagined. It's happened, Mm -hmm. which I'm sure will happen. You've got everyone there. You're peaceful. And you're just about to pass out for the last time. Mm -hmm. And it's the last time. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, all your books, all your blog posts, everything you've ever created has been erased. (gasps) For whatever reason. Okay. And someone in the family says... We've got a piece of paper and a pen, and we know you love to write, so you get to write three final truths, three things you know to be true about everything you've learned in this life mm. that you want us to be, uh, us to remember you by and us to use as lessons. So what would those three truths be? Oh, Lord have mercy. First of all, this is a very sad scenario. <laughs> so I didn't recover from that. <laughs> Hypothetical. All right, so we have three family mantras that we say over and over again mm. that we've been saying since my kids were teeny. Um, and they're all over our house, and so they're ingrained in them. And so I think that it, truly if my family were around me, what I would say to them is what I've always said to them, which is we can do hard things, we belong to each other, and love wins. Love wins? Love wins. Love wins. Mm-hmm. Mm. Little Those Rob Bell in there. All right. We had that sign like long before Love oh, Wins wow. came out. Wow, crazy. It's just so weird because we're just always so, I love that man. Unbelievable. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are every time, you know, when the marriage implosion, my, what we'd say over, we can do it. We can do hard things. Like, we can do hard things. And we belong to each other. The Mother Teresa um, quote that is, um, if we have no peace, it's because we've forgotten that we belong to each other. And I mean, most of my work with Together Rising, which are a nonprofit, um, is just all about remembering yeah. that we're one human family. And just, you know, if, we, if we're going to find peace, it's going to be by remembering mm. that we belong to each other. Mm-hmm. I love that. And love wins is just, you know what? There's always two choices in front of you, and they're always love and fear. Yeah. Always. Like, and, you know, we can choose fear as much as we want, and, and I do all the time. <laughs> But we know that it won't get us anywhere. Yeah. We know that the, the the love choice is usually the hard choice, you know, and it's the one that always pays off. Mm. So those scenarios, um, as a mom, those are the three things that over and over again I try to teach my kids. Awesome. If you were given, I would give you a lump sum of money that was essentially an unlimited amount of money to solve one problem in the world. Oh. <sighs> And you could use it only for that one thing. And when you spent it, it would solve the problem Mm -hmm. of this thing in the world. What would you want to solve? Well, at this moment in time, it would be the refugee crisis. I mean, that's what we kind of tried to do with our little, we did a compassion collective Mm -hmm. at Christmas time with um, Liz Gilbert and Rob Rob Bell and Cheryl Strayed and Brene Brown. Um, My God, I just, what's going on? 
right now with the displaced people um, freeing from fleeing from terror and having no homes for their children and the terrified countries who are scared to let them in. And I know that's complicated. Um, but through that effort and through a lot of what Amy does with Together Rising, we've learned more than I could ever unknow. Mm. Um, it's become pretty much all we think about. Um, the Compassion Collective effort continues. We're working with a group called he- Help Refugees, um, who is all over, who's a UK based um, organization, and they're amazing. They're in all of the camps, just trying to feed and clothe and um, save these babies. So, no. um, you know, that would be it right now. Right. Okay. Awesome. And your life is extremely public. You write everything about everything. Mm -hmm. What's something that you haven't written about that people don't know about you that you're really proud of? Oh, my gosh. That's weird. Well, okay. So I have this thing that I'm not going to. So we have this thing at Together Rising where we say we always want to be better than people think we are. Because I feel like so many organizations are like not as good as people think they are. <laughs> Do you know, like they have these like right, awesome right. things. They're telling people whatever, about yeah, yeah. themselves, like especially nonprofits or, you know, whatever. But like then when you dig deeper, <laughs> so, so I want to be the opposite of that. Yeah, I want to yeah. be like, if the more people peeled back, the more they'd be like, oh my God, and they do that and they do that. So we're always doing like mm. the things that the Together Rising does behind the scenes, <clears throat> the things that no one will know. Mm-hmm. I, I would, because I'm like an incredibly prideful person, I would just love for someone to accidentally discover it all, you know? And But um, I don't know. I mean, my people mm. work their butts off every day to keep... Um, people's lights on and to, mm-hmm. to, to help people adopt kids and to, um, God, it just never ends. And so I'm fiercely, fiercely proud of the work that Together Rising does every day. And not just, not the big things like the refugees yeah. and the love flash mobs and all of that. I'm talking about the little stuff, like yeah. every single day that the emails we get from people who have needs and trust us to meet them. Right. And every day that stuff happens. That's it's cool. Like magic. <laughs> I love it. Cool. One final question yes. before I ask it. Uh, I want to acknowledge you, Glennon, mm-hmm. for your incredible gift and your love and the choice that you make every day to tell the truth, to be honest about everything, and to choose love. I mm-hmm. think it's incredible that you're doing the work, that you continue to go around the country and the world and show up for people that want to listen and that want to show up courageously in their lives. And I think it's incredible that you're a symbol for so many people to see what's possible, Mm. not what's perfect, but what's possible. Mm. And so I really want to acknowledge you for the incredible gift that you are. And I appreciate you. Thank you. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh my gosh, that was beautiful. Nobody ever does that. They're so good. (laughs) You're so good at seeing people. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, My final question before I ask it, where should we connect with you online? Where do you like to hang out the most? Yeah, so I'm like an old soccer mom, so I'm on Facebook. <laughs> okay. My son's like, Mom, only old people are on Facebook. And I said, no, I love Facebook. And yeah. he goes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, wait, I'm not that young so, anymore. <laughs> yeah, so I'm at Glennon Doyle Melton on Facebook. Mm-hmm. And I love Instagram, too. Yeah, I love so your Instagram. I'm at, uh, and then I'm on Twitter, but I suck at Twitter. No. So all I do is Follow accidentally retweet yeah. people. I don't know. I accidentally tweeted a deodorant company yesterday. <laughs> 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 so I'm not amazing at Twitter. Yeah, yeah. So maybe Instagram and Instagram Facebook. Instagram is good. Yeah, yeah, I like your Instagram. Thank you. Um, cool. And also your site, momastery.com. Yes, right? momastery.com. And get the book, Love Warrior. We'll have it all linked up here in a second on the show notes. Uh, the final question is, what's your definition of greatness? I love people. I, I think people are great who, whether they're doing big shiny things that are visible or like the hard work of the world, like relationships and parenting and who are just over and over again, relentlessly choosing love, whether anybody knows about it or not. That's greatness to me. Mm. I love it. Glennon, thanks so much for coming on. I appreciate you. The best. You're the best. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Lewis. (laughs) Hey guys, Lewis Howes here, and thanks so much for checking out this video and this interview. I hope you loved it. If you did, make sure to leave a comment below and share this with your friends. 
Also, I've got a huge announcement. The Summit of Greatness is coming very soon. If you love the School of Greatness podcast, if you love these interviews and you want more, you wanna connect with some of these speakers in person, you wanna connect with me and other people just like you who watch and listen to these interviews, then make sure to sign up for the Summit of Greatness. Go to summitofgreatness.com to learn more. You can check out more about the video that we have that we created for the summit. There's a link in the description below as well. It's summitofgreatness.com. Check it out right now. I hope to see you there. And again, thanks so much for watching this video.